One will likely occur after a big parabolic uh, spot move. And I don't mean the one we've had. I mean the one to come that will be uh, international news. I mean, it'll be front page news because it'll be such a parabolic uh, run of the spot price. And and I'm, I don't care to even guess what it would run up to. But, it, but you know, looking at the 07 chart, it's going to look like that relative to, um, you know, both sides of the spike. And after that, uh, and there'll be some profit taking there, right? But I think that the the price will settle down to a level that's above the incentive price. We're above the incentive price now, but let's say it settles down to 150 or 200, depending upon where, where it spikes to. And then the market will try to uh, seek equilibrium from producers, and that'll be enough to, um, you know, a period of that. We need a period of that for banks and financiers to feel comfortable uh, lending to miners that it's a safe bet that they're going to, there's not going to be another, um, you know, bear market coming up. Hey guys, hey. welcome to Capital Cosm. Today I have a very special guest. A lot of you may know him from the U Twit space, the Uranium Twitter space. It is John Leggett. John was instrumental in helping me grow very early on in my channel. So I'm super stoked to have John on. John, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. It's really kind of you to say too. Uh always enjoy your content and um uh, you're you're prolific i mean it's coming out at a pace it's hard to catch all of it but uh certainly anything having to do with uranium i'm all over it so yeah fantastic as always guys nothing in this video is financial advice neither john nor i are financial advisors so please do your own due diligence with that said john for those who may not know who you are go ahead and give us a background of what got you into the uranium space and you know who you were before yeah, so I, it's, it's definitely a, a before and after moment, right? Uh, so I I uh, spent 34 years in publishing, uh, mostly for healthcare, uh, some some years in uh, high technology, and um, ultimately ended up as a um, division level executive at Gannett Corporation, which uh, was is is the publisher of USA Today. And back in the day, we had 50 television stations and et cetera, a big company. It actually, used to be a Fortune 100 company. Um, way back uh, before newspapers kind of uh, uh, took over, uh, were taken over by digital. But anyway, um, retired seven years ago. Um, had a um, uh, my wife at the time had uh, severe health problems, and and so I ended up uh, retiring early to to take care of her. And uh, she's since passed. But um, mm. so anyway, seven years of retirement uh, as as of next month. And uh, so I started trading in '05. And back then, um, th there wasn't all the online uh, learning that there is now. So there was a company called Invest Tools, which was later acquired by TD Ameritrade. And they had workshops uh, all over the country, you know, three or four day um, workshops. And I would actually fly to them, stay in a hotel, go to the workshop, and some classes I took over and over again. So I really tried to invest in my investor education. And that gave me a good foundation for trading going forward. So I was, a, I would say, a generalist from 05 until the summer of 21. And then I read an article about uh, Sput and uh, before it was even called that, but that Sprott was getting into the space and was taking over UPC. And that that really intrigued me, especially when I started hearing, uh, you know, things like uh, when people get in the space, it's like Hoover Dam breaking or whatever that, that saying was. It, I got a little intrigued. So uh, that was the beginning. And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I use this uh, analogy from time to time, and I, I know Terry tried to do it, tried to do it on your, your call the other day, but he said something about it. There was something about a stool, three legged stool, and he was trying to flesh that out, and it, it, it didn't work out for him. But the, the, uh, what I say is that in 21, which was a fun ride, that was like a table with one leg under it, and the, the leg was Sput. And what was happening there is Sput was uh, coming in and buying up so much uh, of above ground mobile inventory that everyone thought or all the speculators thought that it was going to drive utilities to start contracting because they weren't really contracting uh in mass at the time and 
it was very exciting and it was happening so fast and it really looked like that was going to be the case but no it didn't happen uh utilities do their own thing and go at their own pace and it, it didn't uh it didn't seem to re i think a lot of them to this day don't really understand what sputs all about or or who those pans belong to or what effect they might have on the market going forward but at any rate um it was like a table with one leg under it and now it's now we're at a point where we have a solid foundation under that table and that's it's contracting it's still the financial buyers like like spot and yellow cake and so forth but it's it's a uh, it's utility demand i mean whether it's uh, spot utility demand or uh contracting so we're we're on a firm foundation now and all that secondary uh material has been cleared up um i i um when warren Irwin came out a few months ago and said there's how do you how can anyone think that there's going to be a shortage just probably nine months ago when there's all this secondary supply and has been taking up the gap in what is supposed to be a structural uh, deficit for all this time how do you know there's not massive amount of additional inventory out there and i actually did a response to him uh step by step it's just math and you know there's maybe not that many people that that uh get it but you know, un, uh, underfeeding to overfeeding was a big part of it. There were lots of little uh, things that added up to show exactly where all that secondary inventory came from and the fact that it's no longer around. So we're just at a completely different place and it's a super exciting place. And I don't fret the day-to-day -day, uh, stock movements at all because uh, of my uh, understanding in the phys of the physical market. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And you, we've had numerous people come on the show, give their perspectives, whether it be through TA, whether it be through a fundamental analysis perspective. But I really do believe that this market is very unlike any other commodities market for the points that you outlined just now. In in line with misconceptions, I know you wanted to come in and talk about your top 10 misconceptions of the uranium market. Let's go ahead and dive right into that. What are your top 10 misconceptions of the uranium market yes sir yeah um misconceptions that people have that i like to uh, try to give them some perspective uh especially when <laughs> you see people just they're just so sure that they've they found the reason why the trade's not going to work and that these are some of the perspectives that i give them so uh the, fir the first one is that people say and you hear this a lot right now is i'm too late i've missed the trade um, they see the way the charts have run, especially since September, and they think that they've missed it. But uh, first place to, to understand with this is that right now, the entire combined market cap of all publicly traded uranium miners is about $50 billion. In 2007, when we got that spot uh, uh, peak or spike, uh, it was $150 billion. So at a glance, you know, there's an opportunity there, there to 3x. Now, that's not inflation adjusted. That's just constant dollars. So there's a lot of room there. And I know you interviewed uh, Andy not too long ago back from Finding Value uh, Finance. And his ratio charts are showing uh, 4x from here. Now, some people will sit, look at that and say, oh, you know, I'm here for 10x. I mean, what are you talking about, you know, with these this uh, small moves? And what I'm talking about is, is likely aggregate move. Um, and then within that, if you're picking the right places maybe you'll have some 10 beggars maybe you'll have some that don't move at all so that's just kind of how markets work um you still have to pick the right stocks but the uh, the high tide really will uh, raise a lot of boats and the other big thing is you know people say anytime you hear this time is different in markets it's always a red flag right but this time really is different because in 07 there was uh just a su a supply disruption scare that happened after um the uh, cigar lake flood but really there was no shortage of material there was actually a surplus of material at the time and now we have this unprecedented shortage of material so it's definitely not too late now um another uh, way that you know that's not too late and th this is just you know proof this is just the hardcore reality is that in um, the last bull run in the period from 05 to 12 uh from from 2005 to 2012 there was a uh, above uh, the burn rate of reactor fuel uh, contracting or what we call replacement rate contracting um, that uh, happened five out of those eight year period. So um, the annual consumption rate of the world's reactor fleet uh, is 180 uh, million pounds. And um, 
we were um, above that in some some cases up to 250 uh, million pounds a year of contracting five out of eight years during that period. And you can see it took up maybe a little time for the market to catch on because the big uh, uranium spike didn't happen until 07 and contracting began in earnest in 05. Uh, and for context, the um, cigar-like flood was in 06. So it took just a little time for all that uh, information to filter through and and disbelief to become uh, reality, that type of thing. Now, um, the reason why you're not too late is because we haven't even had one year of replacement rate contracting yet, where we're above the 180 uh, million annual contracting. In 2006, we ended at uh, 160 million pounds, um, point X, you know, 160 million. Now, um, that's less than reactors burned uh, worldwide in, in, um, 2023. Now I'm, I'm probably more than most people. I pound the table on the fact that there's, there's another big variable in here. I mean, really big, that that, uh, could be the entire ground shifting of uranium, just this one thing. And there's so many things like this, but that is that, um, uh, contracted with China, uh, two different entities over there, two different, uh, utility corporations, uh, signed two different contracts in 2023, and they've yet to disclose the exact amount of pounds. Now, Ocean Wall has given us a clue that I'll cover uh, a little bit later on, but uh, we know that those are very big contracts. And the reason why we know they're very big is because they required shareholder approval uh, to be able to sell them up to 200% of the book value of the company. So that's not the market cap, but there's actually a you know an intrinsic book value that you can look up and... Um, I used to know what that was off the top of my head, but anyway, it's that's out there. It's it's the point is these are likely multi-billion dollar contracts that we just don't know the quantity and duration of of the pounds that they've secured. So it's that's a very big deal. And that if if uh, uh, if those had been reported, we'd probably be well over the the one sixty in twenty twenty three. Anyway, you look at it, it was the best year. Uh, in 12 years, the best year since 2012, but still not technically replacement rate contracting. So lots of contracting ahead, especially by U.S. utilities. Okay, now on to the next one. I can't believe we're only on number two already. <laughs> um, the Iranian trade won't work until liquidity returns. And another way of saying that is, you know, when risk on returns. And obviously the, the broad markets have done well lately, but the um, that's concentrated in, you know, seven gigantic multi-trillion dollar tech stocks. Um, and the the underlying, like the Russell 2000, really hasn't caught a bid yet. So when you see that happening, you'll know risk is on. And that's when a lot of people uh, will discover uh, this space. But in the meantime, um, as I said, about $50 billion for the total market cap of uh, uranium mining companies, that's equivalent to just one S&P 500 mid-cap company. And I'm going to pick one out just for grins is Hershey Chocolate. So I have to ask you, Danny, what's more important to you? 10% of the world's electricity, 18% in the U.S., 68% in France, or chocolate? I mean, I bloody love like chocolate, but you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Well, well, nuclear power does power the electrical grid, but, but chocolate does power, uh, I, I guess, people's <laughs> highs and lows in, in some capacity. <laughs> so, But no, no, I mean, to your point, 100%, uh, nuclear power powers, I believe, 10% of the world's electricity grid. 20% of the United States electricity grid, and it can only go up from here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially when, you know, 22 countries have signed on to, uh, in theory, to triple their nuclear uh, output going forward to build build that kind of uh, output. And then you've got the UK going for quadruple. And uh, so that's, that's it's a bright future, but we'll, we'll get more into that. So the point with this one is that we don't need perfect risk on conditions to uh, for this space to balloon up. It's a tiny, it's a tiny little space. And you got some, some people are probably thinking, having a visceral reaction to that. You know, I, I'm all about uranium and I'm tracking 50 stocks and I'm caring about the nuances of each. And you're telling me this is tiny. Well, sorry, it is. It's tiny. And so we don't need much generalist participation for, the space to balloon up when people discover it. And it is undiscovered. That's why I don't put a lot of uh, stock into uh, sentiment in the, in this uh, sector. It's because no one has even discovered it yet. So it's sentiment among the, the people that are here, but they had, the party hasn't started. So um, that's number two. Number three, you hear this uh, phrase 
uh, repeated all the time. I don't know if Rick Roll came up with it or just it's just sort of common knowledge. But high prices are the cure for high prices, right? Um, applies to almost any commodity. What I say uh, for that with uranium is that there's something missing in that sentence. And what's missing in that sentence is the, the words for many years. So let's go back. High prices for many years are the cure for high prices. Wow, that's, just a, that's, that's a great point. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so somebody, there, there was a generalist, um, you know, famous trader was interviewed a few days ago and, and, uh, I won't name names, but, uh, probably because I can't remember who <laughs> interviewed them, but, but he was talking about a bunch of different things, including a few minutes on uranium. And, and one of the things he said is you get the, the price gets up to this level. You'll have some surprise production come in. It'll, it'll be, it'll hit and no one will have seen it coming, blah, blah, blah. I have to tell you that in the uranium space, it doesn't work like that. Every known producer, every known deposit, uh, we, we know collectively, uh, what their, um, what their challenges are in, to get that into production. And we know every step of the way when they, you know, bring on the right people, when they get a permit, when they get financing, when they, uh, find the equipment when they get the labor. I mean, we tend to know every step of the way there won't be any surprise producers. There won't, you'll know, you know, a year, two, three, you know, five and five years in advance, and it'll be analyzed every step of the way. And, and there won't be any surprise producers. Will be, will there be some surprise pounds now and then that hit the spot market? Like, you know, uh, from Olympic dam or from the Uzbeks or something. Sure. Um, and those will get, be quickly absorbed, given the amount of uh, the lack of above ground mobile inventory. But there won't be any surprise production. And just to show you how long things take, it was July 18th of, of uh, 23 when um, UEC kind of pulled the plug on um, on Penn being able to use their uh, resin processing plant, right? Because, and they put out a press release at the time that uh, Christensen Ranch was about to to restart or or to get get going. And we find out now that Christensen Ranch won't be up and going. And the uh, first ore is expected uh, in August of 24. So a year after the press release that they were starting, you know, we are able to to glean step by step along the way where they're at. And and long and short, there won't be any surprises. Number four, because Adam Prawn can ramp up and kill production, kill uh, kill the trade rather. And uh, I've heard that some people have avoided this trade from the beginning because they're afraid of that. I mean, so the the, um, the thing here is this is being tested in real time, and their their Q4 earnings um, and and 2023 retrospective are going to be published here on February 1st, and we'll find out a lot more about exactly uh, what they're able to do. But they've you know set these uh, ambitious goals for the last several years, missed every time. And then now we're hearing about more detailed misses, and they actually themselves pre-warned uh, that they're going to have some production misses. And then we saw from uh, China General Nuclear the other day that their uh, JV um, Ordelic, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, missed by 20%. So they're they're facing challenges, and and you know for the sake of uh, world inventory, I hope they're able to get it together. But um, th- Something to understand with CAP is that nearly half the uh, output of the entire company is joint ventures with other organizations, other other countries, other um, other, other producers, Cameco, for example. So there's there's twelve of those all together around the world uh, that are joint ventured, and so this is according to Oceanwall. But if if you uh, if they were producing at name plate capacity, the the pounds that aren't um, JB'd. Uh, already spoken for, um, or up to other producers to con- uh, for people to contract with, there'd be 31 million pounds left. They they believe their research tells them that 22 million pounds a year of that is going to be headed to China, and um, so that leaves nine million. If you're not working with a producer that's JV'd with them, um, available for the whole rest of the world. So it's that's not huge, a huge amount. I mean that's like you know, double the amount of uh, Niger. And so anyway, and one more example, detailed example uh, with, as it relates to kids Adam prom, and this is kind of interesting to me is so uh, Budnovskoy six and seven is their big future mine. It's not producing yet. And uh, this has been touted for some time as being able to provide 10% of world supply going forward. Great. 
well, we, we, um, there was some repatriation of uh, JVs and we, we thought there, there maybe a, was a Dutch holding company that uh, was in charge of uh, B6 and 7. And it turns out uh, when they repatriated it to Russia, it was uh, really uh, Rosatom, right? So Rosatom owns like 49% of uh, uh, Budnovskoy 6 and 7. Well, we, what we uh, have just found out, and so basically half you know, of that production would automatically go to them where you would expect it to. We just found out that the other half uh, for the first five years of production of B6 and 7 will stay and will go to Russia only. So right there, that's, that's Cigar Lake 2.0, whether people want to realize it or not, mathematically. Because Cigar Lake... It was a the supposedly the world's you know was the world's largest mine at the time, you know oh five uh, or oh six uh, looking to be launched in oh seven, um, and then that flooding hit and it you know, caused a big supply scare. Well, this what this is also expected to be ten percent of world supply, and it's now tied up at five years. So that's it's it's mathematically it's like the exact same scenario, and whether or not people will catch on and and. Uh, get excited about that. It's up to them, but the the story may not be as sort of cleanly able to picture as you can with a mine flood. But yeah, but what's also different this time around is that you have this supply demand deficit backdrop that you didn't have in the mid two thousands. Yeah, well, absolutely. On top of it. So and all sense. these financial vehicles like Sput, um, uh, a bunch of others, and I'm I'm not quite sure what the status of them are exactly. I know Zuri was supposed to be another one. I'm not quite sure what they're up to nowadays, but nonetheless, I mean, you still have all these financial vehicles uh, sucking up the spot market and, and so forth. So this, what we're dealing with today, you know, you're hundred percent correct. You know, this, this could be looked at in much the same vein as a cigar lake, but in a much more supply uh, demand deficit backdrop. Absolutely. Which it's, it could be crazy. It could now. So I, um, Zuri is very good about reporting its net asset value. Um, it, it doesn't um, report its assets under management. So we really don't know how big uh, they've become um, and they don't have to under the Swiss rules. Uh, the PFYN, if I have that correctly, the, the fund down of Singapore, um, they have, they haven't disclosed how much they, they're managing either. But they've also done an interesting thing where they've said they'll buy anywhere along the the, the um, supply chain. So they could be buying SWU, they could be buying conversion. Uh, you don't know to in order to resell the customers. Um, but they're they're still out there. Um, the the um, Adam Prom um, sequester that was going to happen may not now, and that may also be some indication of, of uh, availability of supply. But I'm glad you brought up. Uh, the sequesterers or the uh, the financial buyers, there. This is another myth. This is number five uh, or misconception. There are eighty three right now, eighty three point seven million pounds uh, in in uh, combination held by Sput and Yellow Cake. And in the light, first of all, that's that's a lot. <laughs> that's an awful lot. But it's not a lot in the context of a fifty million pound a year supply deficit that's compounding annually. Right, so if all those pounds came on the market, people say, "Oh, that'll kill the trade." Well, it 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 would certainly probably put us into consolidation for a year and a half or something like that. But it doesn't. It's not going to kill the trade. It will be. It would be absorbed in quickly. But let's uh, look drill down on this a little bit more. So what people don't, a lot of people don't understand is that Sprott doesn't own those pounds. They don't even really control them in a way. They they just uh, manage their custodian of a trust. And the, the trust, the, the pounds are owned by the unit holders or the shareholders of, of, of Sput. Uh, similarly with Yellow Cake, the shareholders uh, own, the, own the pounds of Yellow Cake. To ever unlock those, you would need to do a shareholder vote. And I'm not as clear on it with Yellow Cake as I am with Sput, but uh, I've heard now from prominent people, including Dr. Quakes, that um, the uh, you know Yellow Cake would, would require a a shareholder vote, and I heard that from from another person confirming. Um, I haven't dug into to their um, prospectus to to find that out, but Sprott, I know uh, real clearly is that uh, they would need to get shareholder approval to ever be able to unlock those pounds. You'd actually have to change the charter of the trust the way that it reads to ever make it available, and 
yet a lot of people speculate. And, uh, somebody said the other day, it's only a matter of time till a big utility comes along and um, puts puts out a big check to gobble that up. Well, first of all, you have to go back and and get the shareholder approval. Um, but the other thing is, I don't, I don't think a utility can afford it, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a second. So, um, you'd have to ha- have a, um, a real big premium uh, to get shareholders to agree to that, because a lot of them are thinking, you know, I mean, take Cuppy for example, he's thinking it's going to just going to go crazy. I mean, that's his biggest position as it relates to uranium, and so you're going to convince him uh, that you know 100% premium from here is enough. I don't know if you would. I mean, it sounds pretty good to me, 100% premium. But um, anyway, it would have to be a very big premium, and then you'd have to go to the shareholders. And I know that uh, when, as an example, when uh, URNM wanted to change their charter to allow uh, them to be able to, to bu- make spot a holding because the way that it read before was they were a pure play mining uh, uh, ETF. Well, that that took millions of dollars in effort on Sprott's part. They ended up uh, in the final round of trying to get yeses, calling shareholders to try to get approvals over the phone. Uh, I know that uh, my wife, my wife got a call. I had already voted in in favor of that, and she she got a call and was like, "What are they talking about here?" Talked to them, so we did, and we we made her her vote in favor of it. But so, so are, you got you got the wife on the uranium trade? Oh, absolutely! Wow, yeah. there you go, guys. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the gold standard right there. <laughs> what's what's uh, for better or worse? <laughs> what uh, I. She would rather let me uh, deal with all the details of that. I've I've uh, seen where some people say, "Oh, my wife and I uh, sit down and we watch Justin together." Well, I've I don't get that uh, happening, but but uh, she trusts me, so um, that's what's happening there. Um, at any rate, they, it, it's a big deal to ever make those pounds available. Now, mathematically, Sput is has a current. Uh, Asset value of six point just the nav six point four billion. Let's just call it seven for the sake of round numbers. And you're going to do a hundred percent premium. What utility or or you know utility chain? I mean um, constellation. Let's say is going to come along and put out fourteen billion for opex. I mean not to not to acquire a company that's going to be creative to earnings or something like that, but just for a hard cost fourteen billion. I don't see that happening. I don't. I just don't see it happening. Um, now, what you could have happen uh, is the U.S. Department of Energy or some other uh, something like that, your atom or something, could come along and, um, you know, on behalf of the EU, not that your atom has, has the budget for that, and they could acquire it maybe, you know, once everybody approved it at a big premium and then make it available to, to utilities, their constituents. So that's possible down the road. And I was, I'm already on the record of having come up, having noticed that a little while ago, but, uh, Cuppy was, uh, just on a podcast with Justin and, and, um, Trevor, uh, the going nuclear one that came out. Uh, I actually listened to it last night and he says, he, he, he said, when, when will I, or I think he got the question, when will I, when will you get out of the trade? And he said, it'll be when governments start sniffing around for solutions, when they come in looking for something like this. And as I was just smiling because I was like, I'm, doesn't get I was already thinking government that. Buyers. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to be, and it'd be a big number. It'd be a big number. So myth number six, um, it's only a matter of time until the big money shorts uranium, uranium, the, the commodity. Well, guess what? There's no way to do that. There's no way to short the physical commodity. There's a futures contract on the CME, but the volume is non-existent. I mean, it's and the reason for that is because uh, with that contract, you can't take delivery. Um, I'm a class seven radioactive material, and you can't. It doesn't terminate in delivery. If you wanted to take delivery, it settles in cash. So you can't. Uh, people might use it if you could. Um, but of course they'd have to, uh, be licensed to do that. They'd have to set up accounts at, uh, Chemco or, uh, um, Carverdine or Rano, um, to do that, but there's no way to short it. And so, but people will say, oh, but sh- spot, I can short spot. Well, yeah, you can short spot or yellow cake. All that does is change the net asset value plus or minus to on those instruments. It does not at all change. Uh, the commodity. It doesn't inter- interfere with any term contract. It doesn't interfere with any conversation between a utility and a, and Joe Kelly trying to find you know 
uh, 200,000 pounds. It just, there's no way to short the commodity. So that's the thing of beauty to me. And it's, it's uh, um, something I wish more people understood. Myth number seven, laser enrichment. Laser enrichment is going to come along and the, the, it's going to make so many uh, pounds available by equivalent to U308 that it's going to kill the trade. So, um, and they'll, they'll cite specifically, oh, they're, they're going to get a hold of uh, the um, stockpile of, uh, of tails at, um, at Paducah, Kentucky, and they're going to, you know, re-enrich all those and make 308 equivalent, and that's going to kill the trade. Well, a few things about that. First of all, um, Silex, GLE is the, the uh, laser enrichment company, and the GLE is the U.S. version of that. Um, they haven't yet proven at commercial scale that they can actually do this. And, you know, people are pretty sure that they can. Uh, you know, I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Certainly, Cameco has, and they put their money behind it because they have 49% of the company. But at some point, you know, 2028 to 2030, somewhere around, they'll have the commercial scale uh, test uh, all set up and running. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think they, they strategically located it in, in Paducah. Um, so for that part of the build. And, um, but if they, if they got that contract, the math has already been done on what that best case would yield. And that would, that would re enriching those sales would yield about 7 million pounds a year of youth year weight equivalent. Quite a bit, you know, like, you know, um, 6% of world supply, something like that. And, but that not enough to kill the trade. So anyway, that's, that's number seven. Number eight, fusion will replace fission. I love this quote from uh, Malcolm Rawlinson, who's a nuclear engineer, Rawlinson. 40 years ago, fusion was said to be 20 years away. And it still is. Just love that. Um, so he goes into great. He did a um, interview, the first interview that he ever did with Antonio, which was uh, well over a year ago now, about a year and a half. Um, he goes into great detail on uh, fusion, on thorium, so forth. And uh, of course, with fusion is what you're uh, you're uh, for forcing nuclei together, right? With fission, you're separating them, you're splitting an atom as opposed to fusing them together. And while progress has been made on fusion, um, he likens it this way. Um, it's kind of like the Wright brothers proved you could, a flight could be done, but that's a long way from a 747. And a 747 being sort of analogous to like a commercial fusion reactor. I mean, there's a long way to go there. Um, so that's what's happening with fusion. It's not going to overtake this trade, you know, any <laughs> for decades. Um, and, uh, I don't, you know, I'm not really well versed in that space, but a, a great article on this was in scientific American in June of 23 and it's on ITER, which is the international thermonuclear reactor, which is a, um, a fission test reactor, 35 countries put money into this. Um, and, uh, it's, a, it's a, just a fantastic looking thing. It looks like it's out of a sci-fi movie. Um, but due to lack of progress, cost overruns, there's lawsuits. And uh, get a hold of that article and you'll get a, a good um, snapshot of what's happening lately with, with uh, fission. Yeah, if you can send me that link, I'll post it in the description box below. Well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll get you the link too to that uh, to that first Malcolm interview because it's it's a master class in at least a snapshot of, of uh, the different types of nuclear. And while I'm on that point, um, about thorium, thorium won't re replace uranium. Um, and that's another thing that you hear is that it will. It's just a misconception. So thorium is not fissile material. You have to actually separate um, the isotopes and you use fission to be able to do that. So uh, it's it's um, interesting because it's it's uh, very available around the world, uh, thorium, but it's... it's uh, very difficult to make into fuel pellets. And so there's no economic advantage to, to switching uh, for Malcolm. And I'll, I totally trust him on that. Um, so myth number 10, there'll be a new round of down blending, another megatons to megawatts uh, program, which this was uh, when um, the U.S. Uh, worked it out with Russia back in 1993 to for them to take uh, warheads um, and uh, as part of um, you know, I don't know if it's part of the start treaty, but anyway, to um, 
try to get more warheads off the planet and get them uh, into uh, commercial electrical use. And so they downblended uh, these uh, highly enriched uranium from the warheads to make LEU that can be used in in uh, in the current reactor fleet. And that put uh, 20 million pounds a year of 308 equivalent into the market uh, from 93 to 2013. And the reason why I say equivalent is because you didn't uh, you didn't start with the ore there. You're starting already with LEU. So, but you can do the math and it, it came out to 20 million a year. Um, credit Alkin uh, for that. But um, anyway, so will that happen again? Obviously not in conjunction with Russia anytime soon and probably in our lifetimes. Will it happen with the with the Department of Defense in the U.S.? Uh, will they, they want to do that? if um, shortage of uranium gets bad enough. Well, maybe, but understand that um, the Department of Energy wants to encourage uh, the U.S. Uh, mining um, of uranium to return and become a viable sector for the, for the benefit of future um, you know, long-term energy independence. They don't want to kill that after trying to foster that, right? And of course, different, you know, um, administrations will come and go and they might have different views on that or someone might talk them into it. But basically, uh, I think that's a long shot. I think it's the opposite of what they're trying to do at this point. And also, I'm not sure whether or not the U.S. has the equipment to do it because it was actually done in Russia and then um, you know made available to U.S. Uh, utilities through uh, what was the forerunner of Centris. So that's number 10. Number 11. China will sell its stockpile. China has the largest uh, stockpile of uranium and it's, it's growing daily. And we talked about how much from Kazan and Prom is going there. They have that Al Shankow, Al Shankow warehouse just over the border from, um, from Kazakhstan. And it's, it's the cheapest uh, place for Kazakhstan to deliver material is right there. Uh, just it's a quick uh, train ride away. Um, but I don't think, and I, most people don't think China will ever sell a pound. Uh, to the West because they never have. And they're building 154 reactors. The U S has the largest reactor fleet. China will, will have the largest reactor fleet if they build 154 reactors by far. So they're, they're cranking them out at a pace of eight to 10 uh, per year. And with a, with a goal of 154 that are, that are planned and new reactors require three times the amount of startup fuel as a refueling does. So they need every pound they can get and a whole lot more that they don't have. So I just don't see it. Now, um, Professor Quakes put out uh, a text this morning that they're um, building their own, uh, and we've known this for some time, but they're building their own uh, conversion and enrichment facilities in China. And that may might, might make up for some of the, the capacity loss from Russia. Uh, but um and and that they're they're hinting they might uh, sell some of that, uh, make it available um, to um, utilities around the world, which would be great. I mean that would be a great help. But that's not um, that's not making U uh, three hundred eight available, right? That's that's conversion and, and enrichment. I mean at some point you say well it's, it, there's some equivalent there, but still they're not going to be dumping any of that uh, that material um, onto the market in my view. We also found out recently that um, I would think if you're building a reactor in China, it's going to be all just dealing with the government, right? Uh, that they would be the the, the builder of those uh, through their state-owned corporations like Ch uh, China General Nuclear and so forth. But actually, those corporations have to deal with the banks because they the government has outsourced some of that uh, risk uh, mitigation and, and due diligence to the banks. And the banks are, are requiring any new reactor build to uh, show that they've secured by contract uranium for those new reactors before they're even built, before they'll even approve the, the funding. So uh, that's, an, that's an interesting one. And, and I think uh, why we're seeing so much interest from China, especially in the last year in securing pounds. So, so any questions so far on those? Danny, I know I've been spending a lot. No, no. It You've been uh, very, very concise, very detailed. Uh, I think these are very valid and great points for the audience to to realize. Uh, I often hear a lot of these myths that you've busted, um, even from very generalist uh, friends that I have. 
who aren't who aren't spending the time really researching this space. You know, I've heard like the the fission uh, the argument against fission versus fusion. Oh, fusion will just replace fission. Thorium will replace uh, uranium. Uh, some things along the lines of you know, there's way more uranium than we're being told. There's like something that went viral the other week about a clip where someone said, you know, there's way more, there's way more uranium. If it comes down to it, we'll find the uranium and it'll bring the price back down to reality. Things of that nature. I often hear, and it's really nice to have you kind of go through these point by point and kind of surgically um, debunk them in, in your own way. If you guys disagree with any of these points, by the way, uh, go ahead and leave a comment down below and we can talk about it. Uh, any other uh, myths you want to bust though, uh, John? Uh, so uh, that's kind of it. I mean, I, um, I said 10, I gave you 11. I'm going to skip through one more in it, which is seawater. Uh, a lot of, uh, p- you know, people are now saying, you know, there's an, there's an unlimited amount of uranium in seawater and that's true, but not only is that, and any, then you, uh, quite often hear the follow on, well, it has to be uh, trading at at least 200 pounds to make that, uh, uh, economic uh, to get it out of seawater. Well, even if it were two hundred dollars a pound, um, there there's not the there's not the um, the technology isn't quite there. The, there's no facilities for that. You know, you're still years away from from building the infrastructure to be able to do that. Uh, so anyway, there's there's another one for you. Yeah, we got two oh. bonus uh, two bonus uh, myths right there. Aim to please. Excellent. Uh, so, just a, a couple of thoughts, kind of, to, to, in closing, um, and it, it'll take me more than a minute to close. But, but uh, is this a sector you could hold indefinitely? I think that's what what a lot of people um, wonder about, and you hear some people say, you know, I'm putting my kids in this, and you know, I don't want them to touch it for till 2040 or whatever, and that's fine. Um, I think it is a secular bull market. I, I think that that. Uh, short of a nuclear accident, which is always a uh, left tail risk and the biggest risk, um, short of that, um, and and short of it, it being not something that can be easily um, the the safety ch- uh, changes made for the the remaining reactors around the world, we're going to always have demand, and then the, you have demand growing on top of that. Uh, very, I don't very think we important. have a choice, even if. <laughs> God forbid something did happen. I don't think the world has a choice. Yeah. At yeah, that, that's the point that's, in time that we, we, we don't have the same luxuries that we had in the mid 2000s. Yeah. And people are finally understanding the physics of this that, that you know, intermittents like, like uh, solar and, and wind, they're j- you can might maybe say, okay, they provide an average, you know, grid time of 46% or something like that. But you never know when the when that's going to come, and there's just not enough battery metals on the planet to build up batteries to capture that uh, at the time that they're those are really producing. So anyway, that's a whole separate uh, discussion. But um, I, I believe this is a secular bull market. But I think within that there'll be um, not so much booms and busts. I mean, it'll feel like busts when you're in it, but I, I think there'd be more like uh, booms and lulls. Hmm. Uh, but <laughs> you understand like we had. had- over Sorry, the last two years or so, we had a big boom in 2021, and then we just consolidated for a year and a half. Yeah, and uh, I understand clearly what that was. I hope I was able to explain it. Uh, that was that was a spot driven uh, boom, mm-hmm. and the rest of the market didn't catch on and and do their part. And now we're we're at the doing the part part. Yeah, what, what makes this recent uranium spikes so special is that spot wasn't inv- it wasn't involved to a great capacity. They bought maybe a little under half a million over the course of a year or so, whereas yeah. in 2021, all the way up until early 2022, they bought, I, I believe, what, what was it, 40, 40 million pounds, something of that yeah. nature. So yeah. there's a huge difference there. Uh, the huge boom that we saw in 2021 to mid 2022, that was all Sput driven. Today, Sput had barely had its fingerprints on on this thing yeah absolutely and and we don't need them to they've done the heavy heavy lifting and it's the that those uh equities they're going to keep going up because they'll, they'll follow the market higher as in, material becomes more and more scarce and it, it is already of course um so i'm gonna this is just an, this is it's all opinion that i've been giving right but this this is particularly opinion 
where these uh, laws might come in, just to uh, try to help people maybe um, as for planning purposes, one will likely occur after a big parabolic uh, spot move. And I don't mean the one we've had. I mean the one to come that will be uh, international news. I mean, it'll be front page news because it'll be such a parabolic uh, run of the spot price. And and I'm, I don't care to even guess what it would run up to. But, it, but you know, looking at the 07 chart, it's going to look like that relative to, um, you know, both sides of the spike. And after that, uh, and there'll be some profit taking there, right? But I think that the the price will settle down to a level that's above the incentive price. We're above the incentive price now, but let's say it settles down to 150 or 200, depending upon where it, where it spikes to. And then the market will try to uh, seek equilibrium from producers, and that'll be enough to... Um, you know, a period of that, we need a period of that for banks and financiers to feel comfortable uh, lending to miners, that it's a safe bet that they're going to, there's not going to be another, um, you know, bear market coming up. And so they'll be, they'll be profit taking at the top of that spike. And it's probably wise, um, even if, um, even if it's a secular bull. So there's one. Um, after several years above replacement rate contracting, like I said, we haven't hit, even had one yet. But after you've had, yeah, three, four years, three, four, you know, start watching the annual replacement rate contracting level. Watch, watch the term contracting level always. But when you see that uh, after a few good years and then start, it starts to turn down, there'll probably be some profit taking at that point. And that, that will again be wise. Uh, because what you're doing at that point is there, there's, um, there's a herd mentality of fuel buying at a certain time. Uh, whenever, when all your peers are doing it, it, that's when they're doing it. And that's, you know, that's not according to me, that's according to Alkin. Uh, but I think you can observe that um, on, the, on the charts going back. And so th after that, there'll be some less demand, even though there'll be growing demand from SMRs and all kinds of other places and less and less material. Maybe it won't be that big of a lull. That's why I said it's not going to be a bust, it'll, but it'll be a lull. But I, I think there'll be one after, um, after term contracting uh, cycle has, has, um, started to to um, come down because you know that utilities are covered at that point and, and they'll be covered for a few years and then they'll be at it again. Um, and then another will occur, th this I'm just sort of picking up from chatter and I, I don't agree with it. I don't, I don't know, I'll say why, but I mean, I agree that it'll probably happen, but it shouldn't happen. And that's when some people say, as soon as next gen uh, announces their mind, that's when I'm selling. Not when they, you know, start getting ore out of the ground, but when they announce their mind, because uh, people will think, will marvel at the size of how big Arrow is and what that's going to do to quell the market. But mathematically, again, 50 million annual supply deficit compounding annually, uh, 30 million pounds a year after um, next gen is built and, and ramped up is not going to uh, uh, ruin the market in an, in a, a market that's, um, uh, where tier one mines around the world are continuing to, to deplete and they will be even more by the, that point. Um, so that, but people will say that. So that just be aware of that. And then another one is when they actually start producing, uh, people say, okay, that's, that's, that's it now. That's the end of the trade <laughs> because it's just, it is a big, going to be a big, beautiful, uh, producer, but, um, it won't satisfy world demand. And also, Next gen uh, is touted to be what will be the most profitable mine of any uh, material being mined by any company, any single mine anywhere in the world, any kind of material. I mean, that's how good that that deposit is. So I would argue that you know those laws, if created, are times to to double down and buy more next gen, but not advice. Just opinion, and it's probably what I would do because I think the profitability of that thing is going to be crazy, and they'll, they'll be pressured to to, uh, to have a dividend down the road, and I'm sure that they will because they'll they, they'll pay back uh, the costs um, if they build it themselves, uh, you know, right away. I mean, in a very short period of time, that's how profitable it'll be. Yeah. So, so what? I mean, you mentioned next gen there. Would you be willing to drop kind of a few names that you're really bullish on at the moment? Um, so, um, global, of course, global atomic, um, 
one kind of dark horse that I like, it's, it's still, uh, it's probably two years away from production is Lotus. They have the uh, Kyla Kira mine. They have $200 million of infrastructure sitting there ready to go. And I think that's like the market cap of the company. Um, and they, but it's already paid for. It's there. It's ready to go. It's been in care and maintenance. And this was a um, John Borshoff mine during the last, um, during the last cycle. So they actually proven that they can produce and uh and get get the material to market um but uh i think a lot of people they they know the story there is there's probably going to be one more raise when they do the final investment decision uh before they um before it really takes off and they want to get that out of the way but it could be a combination of a raise a um a loan you know loans um and contracting they're they're unhedged right now no contracting um per Dustin Garrow. So that's that's a that's a, a sort of hidden favorite that I like. But I'll, I'll take a a moment to say that I I highly recommend that everyone subscribe to Uranium Insider. And um, well, I know you're you're uh, in favor of that, and, uh, but it's it's really really a great resource. But also their portfolio has done extremely well. And uh, if you want to know what I'm loaded up on, I'm loaded up on what their portfolio is, which I'm not going to give out. It's proprietary and and uh they're they're household names but i don't want to you know um violate that trust but i um that that'll give you some hint if you know what those are then then you'll know what i when i'm loaded up on but also i think that for most people especially people that um you know have full-time jobs and can only devote a little bit of time to this here and there i don't see anything wrong with your and n i don't see anything wrong with your and j and it just depends on if you're a little bit more conservative, you know, you are in M, um, you know, has the bigger players and it has uh, dividends. And then you are in J um, is, is the smaller players. If you're going more upstream, more aggressive, but it's going to be more volatile uh, uh, in that ETF. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I fully agree with your point there, especially for, let's say, generalist investors or for people who don't do this thing for a living. You may not have the time you need to dedicate to fully research a sector as deep as the uranium sector. So the way I kind of view it, uh, Uranium Insider is a great newsletter. We are affiliates. Link is down below. But regardless, you know, I view newsletters like Uranium Insider as kind of like my R and D team. If I'm, if my portfolio is a company and I'm the CEO of the company, I need an R and D team to do the work for me. So I've got a team of analysts and. And by way of Justin Hewn and his team over there, they spend the hours, they do all the research. I consume the newsletter and then I can make my own decisions then as an executive of my portfolio. So uh, that's, that's another trait uh, that I think could work really well for generalists. Even like myself, I'm not a hundred percent uranium guy or anything. I, uranium is my biggest holding in my portfolio, but I do leverage a few newsletters to kind of give me ideas, kind of um, steer me in the right direction there. So really, uh, cool. Uh, really, really good to, to hear it coming from you as well. Uh, one last question to probably let you go. Uh, you're, you're big in uranium. Is there anything outside of the uranium space that you're invested in as well? Or are you kind of like, uh, mis- are you kind of like Terry as well? Terry Papanu, hundred percent allocated. Um, I have, um, I'm almost 100. percent I have a whisper in uh, of things in um, in the precious metal space, and and they're leveraged. So um, they're if that ever if it ever pops, and it sure has been predicted so long. And uh, but if it ever does, I'll I'll be able to take some advantage there. But I really there I can't tell you the number of times that I've regretted even maintaining those um, because. Uh, um, it just they've underperformed um the uranium space uh, by far and and uh but anyway mathematic i uh, you know chart wise they're right on the cusp of doing something right so uh it's hard not to ha- keep a little bit in that space um so in, you know in closing I, I would just like to say this i think a lot of people and you just you see it on twitter people fret about the daily moves of the uranium stock or even weekly or monthly uh, and I, I worry about that. I think they, you know, they, they, they work themselves into a frenzy over it. And what I would say is this, become a student of the physical market of uranium, and then you'll know where you're at in the cycle at any given time. And you'll know 
about how much materials is out there. You'll know about uh, contracting that's occurring and you'll, you'll know, um, you know, really where you're at. And how do you do that? Well, I recommend that you follow closely people who actually work in the space who are hundred uh, percent in the uranium space. And I, I pref- and I'm talking about people in the industry uh, like Dustin Garrow, like Pierre Jander, like uh, Bram Van, Van der Elst. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm missing hundreds, but, and then from the analyst community, all of your full-time um, hedge funds that are, that are devoted to uranium, like uh Sitchum Cove, you know, Mike Alkin, um, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm blanking on the one here in Dallas, but um, uh, Art, Art Hyde, um, right. Um, and um, uh, Tribeca out of um, Australia. Listen to all those, listen to people who, who are devoted their lives to uranium. Um, and uh, I'm just, I could do a little, a quick shout out to someone in the uranium community that I think that's true of, and that's you know NT Principal Capital, my friend Tom, um, formerly Nostra Thomas, but um, he he calls the tune like I can't even uh, so many times I think he's going to be wrong or something, and it bears out to be right after a period of time, and he's great at calling entries, especially on juniors. And, um, so I, um, anyway, shout out to him. And, but I mean, I'm, I'm missing hundreds of people that, that I just really, um, am, am impressed with, but you learn the physical market, learn it through the people who not are speculating about, you know, what it is or might be doing, but to the people who actually work in the industry or who analyze it full time. So that, that's, that's the thought I would leave you with there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've always put it this way. You know, if you're going to learn basketball, would you rather learn learn it from Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or, uh, you know, just some random guy next door? Yeah, you know, you want to learn from the best, right? So fantastic, John. This is a this is a great uh, maiden's voyage into the podcasting space. Here, hopefully, we can have you again uh, for another update at some point da- uh, down the line. Uh, drop us where people can find you, John. Yeah, just uh. um uh... Leggett underscore John on Twitter. Um, you'll probably recognize my icon that looks just like me, except for when I'm wearing my glasses. So, um, and that's, that's, that's all I, I do. I don't have a website. I don't sell anything. If anybody ever says they're me and they're trying to sell you something, I'm not selling. I'm too lazy for that. You know, I'm, I retired, uh, you know, I've, I've got a hard stop because I got other things going on and, and, um, so yeah, um, but but I am all about uranium. <laughs> so you can DM me if you want. If you have a question, somebody says something you don't under, understand, it doesn't make sense. Um, feel free to DM me, and and uh, you know you and I have had some conversations that way. And and uh, and look, I'm glad. Thank you so much for having me on. I've really enjoyed it, and, and happy to come back. Fantastic. Yeah, John was one of the first people uh, that supported me when I first started the channel back in early 2023 so i i never forget the people who supported me early so always grateful to have you on john uh thank you guys if you enjoyed this video be sure to give it a like subscribe to the channel if you haven't already comment down below do you agree or disagree with any of the myth busting points that john put forward we'll have a conversation down below drop a comment and i will see you in the next episode bye y'all